Hey, this is Helen Chambers Biology coming to you with a lecture on a recap of evolution and a preview into um, gene pool and genetic drift. First thing I want to go over is um, a classic uh, quote um, that was done um, by a geneticist, ironically, that says nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So what we're talking about here is that everything in the world around us, um, you know, all these variations and changes and differences, um, you can't explain it except in the light of evolution. And so let's go ahead and kind of take a step back here um, and talk about John Baptiste Lamarck. Now, before this all began, before Darwin, before all of this, um, Lamarck, which was around in the 1800s, um, had a precursor idea that things could change. Now, b before this, biblically, um, the standpoint was things were put on this earth as is and that they've never changed and that's just the way, the way it is. Um, well, Lamarck said, well, wait a minute, I think things could change um, based off of um, their tendency to wanna be perfect for that environment. What he means by this is that if you have really tall trees, you can simply grow your neck because you need to reach those leaves. And so that idea of an acquired trait um, was obviously false because you can't just simply grow your neck the same way that a pig can't just simply fly because he wants to, okay? So this implies that the organism itself could actually change directions and evolve whatever it is that they need. Um, it was a good idea. It started the ball rolling, but it wasn't quite accurate. So Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace um, came about, and ironically, they both came up with the same idea of natural selection literally at the same time. Darwin spent five years traveling around the world and designed this idea of natural selection, but then sat on it for 30 years, whereas Wallace went to um, Indonesia um, and studied animals that kind of corresponded between Asia and Australia and kind of noticed that there was a little bit of differences based off their environment. So Alfred Wallace wrote a paper about natural selection and that actually stimulated Darwin to go ahead and publish his book that he'd been sitting on for 30 years with the same idea. So again, this is not just a Darwinian um, idea. Other people came up with and um, did research on natural selection. Now, Darwin's theory was a result of many, many years. Like I said, it took him 30 years just to write the book on top of the five years of traveling around the world. And what he was basing everything off of was these observations that he made. Now, both Wallace and Darwin came up with this idea that the environment is the agent of change, not you yourself, okay? So a couple of things I want you guys to remember, and this is from our lecture we did in class, but natural selection acts on your phenotype, okay? So these are your physical variations that were due to mutations um, that can eventually lead to an entirely new species if isolated, okay? We also need to remember that natural selection is the survival of the fittest. Now, to be fit means that you survive and you reproduce. So if you're only reproducing one egg at a time, that might not be able to survive in the long run as a species. So overproduction is also an agent in natural selection to help the species actually um, counteract that struggle for survival, okay? Remember adaptations um, you have is physical, behavioral, and functional, so either physical on the outside, um, behavioral is more mental, and then functional is on the inside. Um, and all of these will lead us to the ability to survive. Now the one last thing that is an attribute in natural selection is catastrophes. Okay, so obviously like an asteroid um, is gonna cause massive, massive environmental changes and massive die out, but you have the ability for other animals to adapt and survive in that new changing environment, which is actually what happened with the mammal explosion right after the dinosaurs. Now natural selection 
also allows for us to explain Darwin's finches. Now, the Galapagos finches has many, many different species, but they all originated from one original mainland species that got taken out to the Galapagos for some hurricane or, you know, something happened um, and brought them out to the islands. And then as a bird species, you're not all exactly the same. So some birds, because of competition, were like, hey, bro, why don't you go eat the nectar? I'm going to go over here and eat the insects. And so eventually they started to eat differently because of competition. They started to mate with those people that were in that area. So only mate with the nectar eaters or only ate, eat with say the cactus eaters. Um, and all of a sudden, given that reproductive isolation, over thousands, millions and thousands of years, um, eventually it evolves into all these different species that we see today. Now, this week, we're gonna be looking at genetic drift um, as an activity. So this next lab that you're gonna do um, is gonna deal with all these aspects. So please keep in mind that your original population, guys, we're going back to Hardy Weinberg here, okay? Your original population is made up of allele frequencies. So how many species have specific genetic allele genotypes okay so big a big a big a little a little a little a um and that that gene pool is the pool of organisms that can actually interbreed together and result in viable offspring so viable offspring means that the offspring can mate with others and reproduce children that can also have kids okay so there's no point in having a child if that child can't have more children because it's going to injure um, species line okay so gene pool is a pool of genetics within a species that can interbreed okay so what happens is that we take that gene pool. So maybe it was a 20%, 50%, or maybe it was an 80, you know, 20%, whatever the ratio was of that genetic frequency, okay? And now we're gonna add in a chance event. Now, you guys are gonna be doing this in your lab. You're gonna actually be um, using um, M&Ms and we're gonna take um, a handful of M&Ms and we're gonna drag them out and slap them on an island. So we become the hurricane, the chance event, Maybe it was an earthquake or tsunami um, that grabbed a bit of those organisms and moved them elsewhere, okay? So whether it was over a mountain range or out to an island, um, whatever it might be, we are now altering both populations, okay? So if I grab a bunch of, say, blue ladybugs and I bring them over to an island, what's left behind now is not red and blue, which was the original population, but what's left behind is the original population is now more red and the island population is now more blue. Now, if they can't mate together, we're gonna see a change in species, okay? So that's genetic drift. Now, genetic drift is gonna lead us to what we call the founder effect. So whoever got taken to that area are now the founders of that area so for example the galapagos tortoises um somehow some way maybe on a seaweed um you know drift they got stuck from the mainland and drifted out to the galapagos islands um there was no sea turtles or sorry there was no tortoises um on the galapagos islands back in the day and so they were the founders of that specific island and those tortoises that survived. So if they had a really long neck, they were able to eat the um, plants on that specific island, they survived. If you had a really short neck on that island that you landed on, you died out. And so if you died, you cannot pass on your traits. And so again, over millions and millions of years, passing on those beneficial phenotypes, not necessarily genetics, but beneficial phenotypes, eventually you start to see a change in different species. Okay, now the next one um, is actually really interesting. This is known as the bottleneck effect. Now the bottleneck effect is a genetic drift. It's a chance event, but it's specifically human impact. All right, so what's happening here is that you can see over 
on um, the image right over here is that you have your original parent population that's a bunch of different colors and we're going to hunt out those specific colors out of the population. So say I just want to hunt out all the big marbles and what I get left behind in my bottle when I shake it out are not now all small marbles. And so now what's left behind in the genetics of the population is only small alleles. Does that make sense, guys? So if I'm hunting off big A, big A, all I have left now is big A, little A, and little A, little A. That allele frequency is starting to shift. And then now I'm starting to hunt off, say, the heterozygous, and then now all I get left behind is my recessive alleles. So this in the marine ecosystem is known as fishing down the marine food web. So back in the day, we used to, I mean, if you think about biblical times, um, be able to feed an entire town on one fish. Well, why? Because that fish was giant, okay? It was huge. And so this, you know, giant, giant, 100, 100 pound fish, um, hundreds of pounds, could feed a town. But nowadays we go out and we go fishing and we're like, yeah, we caught a fish, it's this big. And we think that that's giant, it's not. Well, why are these fish this big now compared to this big is because we've hunted off those allele frequencies. And so therefore fishing down the marine food webs is leading to the extinction of a genetic frequency that we can no longer get back, okay? So again, as a review, the gene pool is the entire genetics of a population that's mating together. Genetic drift is when we start to alter the genetics of that population, either through chance events like hurricanes, tsunamis, you know, earthquakes, or human impact events, okay? Now, regardless, we're altering and changing the genetics of that population, which in turn is going to alter or change as time goes by that actual species. So we might have started off with, you know, a giant thousand pound bluefin tuna, but nowadays we're only getting say 200 pound bluefin tuna and the physical attributes of that tuna has now changed. It might actually be a different species now. Okay, so all of this can lead to speciation. So the last thing I wanna leave you guys with is our lab. I'll be giving you an entire lecture um, on how this lab works. I will be doing the lab for you, so you don't need to get any M&Ms or anything like that, but I just wanna emphasize that what we're gonna be doing is reenacting this idea of genetic drift versus natural selection. Natural selection is when you are being best suited for that environment um, and it's not any chance events. It's just adaptation, things are slowly changing, but it's not like a big event that's altering you guys, okay? And that's usually by luck. Um, keep in mind that you guys can always um, go back and watch Bozeman Science or Amoeba Sisters on genetic drift and gene pool. Um, they do a great job on that if you guys want more information. So otherwise, um, thank you for watching and hopefully you guys um, understand what's going on and please remember to give me a shout out on either email or Instagram if you guys have any questions. Um, Instagram is Whole and Chambers Biology and remember my email is just through School Loop if you guys have any questions. So um, that's it. So thanks for watching. This is Whole and Chambers Biology.